The stories that we tell about our lives serve as a kind of extended memory for us to remember the gremlins that we are very liable to forget. So when we're telling other people what we're actually doing in detail, it becomes real to us. We rewrite our autobiographical narratives, right? And we can't no longer deny that the behavior is happening. And in doing that, in telling that story, those autobiographical narratives don't just organize past experience, they actually become a roadmap for the future. Those words as tools and stories becomes the way then we can remember what, what really happens when we use our drug, which our own brains are liable not to let allow us to remember. What is going on, guys? Welcome back this week to another amazing, very, very, very exciting episode of The Superhuman Life. As always, guys, I'm your host, Frank Rich. Before we jump into today's conversation, let me just remind you guys who we are and what we're doing here. This is the only podcast in the world that is dedicated to helping men break free from the shackles of their porn addiction through the power of faith and fitness. And guys, this week we are diving deep into dopamine in the porn addicted brain. And I have with me here today one of the world's leading experts on both of these topics, both of the topics of dopamine and really understanding what's happening at the brain neuroscience level with both pornography and sex addiction. Joining me on today's show is none other than Dr. Anna Lemke. Anna Lemke is a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine and is the chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnostic Clinic. A clinician scholar, she has published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers, book chapters, and commentaries. She sits on the board of several state and national addiction-focused organizations and has testified before various committees in the United States House of Representatives and the Senate. Anna keeps an active speaking calendar and maintains a thriving clinical practice. She is also the author of the brand new, not brand new, but fairly new best-selling New York Times best-selling book, Dopamine Nation. And in today's conversation, Anna and I get into understanding what is dopamine, why is it there, what role does it play in our lives outside of addiction, and how do we get addicted? What is it that's happening at the at the dopamine level and, and at the, the brain level when we're consuming pornography, first, second, third exposure? We also talk about the importance of radical honesty, of actually telling the truth and what is happening at the brain level of when you just openly don't lie. We also then talk about what are some of the things that men can do to not speed up the process because that's a problem, right? When you're looking to speed something up, but to actually kind of maintain and monitor this plain pain pleasure balance and so much more guys Anna is an incredible writer incredible speaker like I said she's been studying this this work for almost 30 years so we're incredibly honored to have here with us today but without further ado guys let's get into today's conversation understanding dopamine in the porn addicted brain with Dr. Anna Lemke out of Stanford University hope you guys enjoy we'll see you on the other side Dr. Lemke Welcome to the Superhuman Life. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I've I've been looking forward to this since the day that we locked it in, and and and, and really before that. I mean, the minute I read your book here, which is over my uh, shoulder here, and and just you know, I've seen you on Rogan. I've seen you know some of the work you've done with Andrew Huberman, who I'm a big big fan of. I can't think of there's a better person in the world really to dive deeper into dopamine and really the impact of pornography obviously like i was telling you before you know we hit, hit record here that's a big part of the work that i do specifically with men and helping them you know overcome their addiction to porn so super excited just thrilled to kind of dive in and just really just get nerdy on on these topics here today so um i think probably the best place to start here Anna, is can we can we i don't know if defining dopamine is is the right way to you know set that up but you know, obviously it's a big word and there's, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, talk around the, you know, dopamine detox and obviously when you get into the addiction space, but what is dopamine and then, and what role does it play in our lives other than the addiction side of things that we're going to address here today? Yeah. So dopamine is a chemical that is released in our brains. It has a number of different functions. It's very important to movement. In fact, it's the depletion of dopamine in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra that is responsible for Parkinson's disease, which is a movement disorder. Dopamine is also released in another part of our brain, which is deep in our emotion centers of the brain, which is called the reward circuit. And dopamine is really important for the experience of reward 
motivation, and pleasure. It's not the only chemical in the brain that's important to reward motivation and pleasure, but it is probably the final common pathway of um, all reinforcing drugs and behaviors. There is some science suggesting that dopamine may be even more important for motivation than it is for actual pleasure, because those are slightly different things, right? Our motivation to get something is slightly different from the euphoria that we feel once we're, we've gotten it and we're ingesting it. Um, and there's a famous series of experiments where scientists sort of re-engineered a rat so that it didn't have dopamine receptors in certain key parts of, of its brain. And what they found was that in those rats, the rat, if you gave it food, would eat it and seem to get pleasure from it. But if you made the rat work to get the food, like if you put the food some distance away, or if you made the rat have to press a lever to get the food, the rat would basically starve to death. It wasn't motivated to do the work to get the reward. So dopamine is really important to the experience of pleasure, but it's also equally or even more important to the experience of motivation to go and get that reward. And is that motivation, is that then the tied to the movement part? Because I, I don't think I've ever heard dopamine associated with movement. Can you speak more to that side? Yeah, so exactly. It makes perfect sense that dopamine would be involved in pleasure motivation and also movement because for most of human existence, we have had to move our bodies uh, to go get our reward. Today, that's no longer true, which is part of the problem that we have now. But even the most primitive nematode or worm will release dopamine in response to food in its environment and in response to the locomotion to get the food. So for many, many millions of years of evolution across species, dopamine is related to motivation, pleasure, movement, and how those things link together. Got it. Yeah. And, and, and you said something really, really important there, uh, you know, with in today's world. And I, and I know for you, you've been, you know, you've been studying this for coming up on almost three decades now. Am I am, am I correct there? What have 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 you seen in your you know years of of work with this rise, obviously, in, you know, social media and, and, and pornography, which we're probably going to going to get in today? How have you seen that playing out in, in your clinical work? So starting in about 2005 in our clinic, uh, which is a, the addiction medicine dual diagnosis clinic, so we treat patients with straight addiction and with other co-occurring mental health disorders, um, we started seeing more and more people coming in specifically seeking help for pornography, sex addiction, and compulsive masturbation, mainly, um, mainly middle-aged men. And nearly universally what they reported was that their sort of sexual behaviors and masturbatory behaviors were manageable until the advent of the smartphone and the sort of 24 seven nature of its digital delivery system just was like the thing that tipped them over the edge and created a, a phenomenon where the, their lives were out of control and they were clearly, you know, harming themselves um, as a result of their, their addiction. What's been interesting in the last five years or so is we've been seeing more and more very young men, teens and, and 20s coming in with sex and compulsive pornography and masturbation addiction. Um, and it's it's been interesting to see that. I think, you know, what, what we're seeing is actually rising numbers of people struggling with this problem. But also, um, I think the good upside of the Internet more realization that they're not the only ones, that, they're, that there's potential help, that it is an addiction, that they don't need to feel this overwhelming shame about the behavior, that they, you know, it is something that happens not just to them and others, and they can, they can do something about it. Yeah, and that's definitely something that 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 I felt and experienced here. You know, so I launched this podcast in July of of 2019. So we're coming up on almost three years, and for me, it was overcoming my struggle of almost 20 years. So I'm 38, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older to where I didn't have the devices like in my early teen years, but it definitely still got me, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. um, it's obviously been very, very promising to, you know, to see people like yourself and, and some of your other colleagues, like really getting out there. And, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, yet, yet mainstream yet, because I still get it. Like, you know, when I'm going on a podcast and I'm sure you get this as well, it's like, Oh, we're going to have the taboo conversation. Why do you feel, you know, as a, as, as an expert, as a, you know, as a professional here, why do you still feel then like that people need to layer it with that 
it's a taboo topic. It's like, it's not, right? It's a part of all of our lives. It's more than half of the men statistically are struggling with this. Why do you feel it's still got this taboo label attached to it? Yeah, interesting question. So uh, let me just, I, I just want to sort of echo what you're saying is I'll, I'll often go on shows and we'll talk about almost every drug, but no one will bring yeah. up the pornography uh, sex addiction thing. And it's funny because my book, Dopamine Nation, actually opens with the case yes. of somebody who is severely addicted to um, pornography and compulsive masturbation, actually makes his own masturbation machine. And um, my editors, you know, my agent were like, well, are you sure you want to open with that? And I was like, yep, yeah, that's that's the story. That's the heart of the story. Even though I talk about a lot of other drugs in the book and behaviors, I'm like, we uh, that we, we need to open with that. So I'm really glad I did that. And I've gotten a lot of gratitude from people for doing that, which has been nice. Why the added layer of shame? I think it has to do with a couple of things. I think it has to do with the ways in which sex is like the last physical thing that we do with our bodies that connects us to our bodies that is still kind of okay, right? Because um, like there's a lot of physical, so much of the physicality of our lives is gone now. You know, we, we don't, except for sadly right now in the Ukraine, we, we don't fight people physically. You know, we don't do physical things to get our food. Machines have taken so over so much physical labor. So we don't really move our bodies. So there's this, this way in which sex has become kind of like the preoccupation of the entire culture. At the same time that we have this, this movement in which the adjudication of sexual interaction is now outside of the purview of religious mores and in the criminal justice system. So that, you know, not, not to make a comment one way or another about the merits of the hashtag Me Too movement, but the, the bottom line is that we have a much freer society when it comes to normative sexual practices. And yet we have more conflict around sexual practices than ever before. And the way that we're now reconciling these conflicts is to essentially make it a legal matter and adjudicate it and talk about aggressors and victims. And I think in that climate, it becomes very, very difficult to talk about sex especially sex addiction, because of course, inherent in sex is, is the sort of dominance um, kinds of things. I mean, inherent in sort of sexual acts, you know, there is, there are power differences, or let's say that can be an aspect of healthy sex, right? But how do you then integrate that in a culture where really almost any man is potentially, um, you know, uh, an aggressor, um, somebody who will be accused of sexual assault. I think that adds a whole other layer of shame when it comes to pornography and sex addiction and, and men in particular getting help with these types of problems. Yeah, it's a really, it's a, it's a really great point you, you make there. And I, and, and I definitely want to know your thoughts on this, you know, because you're, you're saying pornography and sex addiction. And I know clinically, and obviously you're, you're, you're the perfect person, I believe, to, to ask this to. I know clinically, like sex addiction is, I don't think label would be the right word, but it is something you can kind of clinically be diagnosed with. But it's my understanding, and maybe you can kind of educate and enlighten me here, that pornography addiction is not clinically accepted within the DSM-5 yet. I know they have gambling, and, and I believe even video games have made it in there yet. Do you think that the fact that it's not yet clinically accepted and you still get some, you know, therapist that I've ran across and I've had, you know, clients come to me, Hey, I get my therapist, you know, we're going to seek marriage counseling and they're saying, you guys are having trouble with sex. Why don't you guys watch pornography together? So do you think that there's an element of that in the industry? It's, it's, it's kind of split sideways where some people are like, it's not bad. There's no problem with it. And, you know, obviously now you're getting kind of, kind of a moral uh, argument as well. But do you think that is playing any, any role into kind of the taboo nature and, and, and the fact that it's, it's, it's not yet fully accepted clinically as, as a true addiction? What are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting because we're talking about, so you talk about taboos and then you talk about normalized behavior and, 
you know, on the one hand, pornography has become very much normalized behavior. Mm. And I've had people say to me, there's no such thing as sex and pornography addiction. Like that's, that's not a real thing. Yeah. That's just different people's cultural lifestyles or that's, you know, some kind of uh, Puritan, um, you know, uh, layer um, or lens that you, that you use to, to look at the world. And I, and I, of course, I'm like, that's so wrong. <laughs> I mean, come to my office and talk to this person who lost everything and, yeah. and wanted to kill himself because of his compulsive overuse of uh, of pornography, masturbation, and sex. Why do I say sex and 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 uh, pornography? Be because first of all, it's all the same bucket. You know, it's mm. all related to the orgasm, which is you know the a key piece of the drug here. Incredibly physical and physiologic. Um, many different ways to get there, but it's important to recognize that for some men, it, it's about sexual partners for other men it's just about pornography and sex with themselves right some of them it's the, both of them together and the one can lead to the other so you know it, it's i i lump them and i'd be curious what your response is to me it's it's all the same bucket and i would even put in their love and love addiction and, and attachment addiction and, and i would even potentially put in social media addiction in the <laughs> same bucket because it all relates to wanting to make a connection with another human being um you know, and I would put myself in this category, right? And I talk in my book about how I got addicted to romance novels. To me, it's all of a piece. Um, and and it doesn't mean that every behavior in that bucket is pathological, right? So so you can have probably healthy engagement to some extent with a romance novel or with maybe even some pornography that's not exploitative of the people in the pornography. Um, you know what I mean? But but what it's and just social media, there's healthy engagement with social media or what whatever way your your medium of human attachment. But what is also very clear is that it can become, especially in our modern world where we have this infinite access, increased potency, increased variety, limited, unlimited quantity, it can become an, an addictive and very destructive behavior. Yeah, no, and, and I definitely agree. And I think it's, you know, it's obviously it's case by case. I'm sure you you meet with younger men, you know, late teens, early 20s that have a porn addiction, but never had an actual intimate relationship with any woman. So it's hard to say that guy has a true sex addiction because he's never actually even experienced real intimacy. So for him, it's obviously clearly dopamine. So can you can you speak about now what's what's occurring in in the brain and with dopamine on, you know, first, second exposure to pornography and how this leads a man uh, to, to, to getting addicted? Sure. So one of the most interesting findings in neuroscience in the past 75 years is that pleasure and pain are co-located in the brain. So the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain, and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So when we do something pleasurable, we tip one way, painful, it tips the other. But one of the overarching rules governing this balance is that it wants to be level, which scientists call homeostasis. It doesn't want to be tip for very long to the side of pleasure or pain. And our brains will work very hard to restore a level balance after any deviation from neutrality. So let's say, you know, after an orgasm, and an orgasm releases a whole lot of dopamine in the brain's reward pathway, we get this tip to pleasure. But no sooner has that happened that our brains adapt to increase dopamine by downregulating our own dopamine receptors and our own dopamine production, not just to baseline level, but below baseline level. That's the come down, right? Or the after effect. I imagine that as these little neural adaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again, but they like it on the balance. So they stay on until we're tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That is that moment that we experience right after the intense pleasure. And initially in our forays with pleasure in all its various forms, we might not even notice that come down. It might be outside of our conscious awareness. But it's there, and it's the price that we pay for every pleasure. It's the way the brain restores homeostasis. Whatever the initial stimulus is, it first tips an equal and opposite amount to the other side before going back to level. That's also true for painful stimuli. When we exercise, we press on the pain side of the balance. Those gremlins hop on the pleasure side, and we feel good. That's a runner's high, right? And then they hop off, and we restore homeostasis. So that's the fundamental rule. Now let's get into what happens with the addicted brain. With repeated exposure to the same or similar reinforcing stimulus, that initial response gets weaker and shorter, that is the dopamine release gets less, but that after response gets stronger and longer. In other words, those little gremlins 
start to accumulate and they start to get muscles, right? And pretty soon we end up with enough gremlins on the pain side of the balance to fill this whole room. And then we're in what is called a dopamine deficit state. And the gremlins, if we do it enough, they camp out there. They're sort of living on the balance. That means when we're not using, right, we're walking around in a dopamine deficit state. We're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, craving. Other things are less enjoyable, right? Other things that used to give us pleasure no longer do. And now we need to keep using not to even get high, but just to feel normal and restore the balance. And it is this dopamine deficit state, that overwhelming physiology to want to restore homeostasis, which drives the addicted brain and drives repeated use and explains also why we need more of our drug and more potent forms, for example, more deviant forms of pornography over time to get the same effect or more deviant fantasies. You know, we started out with a kind of like a generic fantasy and now we've got this kind of crazy stuff going on right in our heads. And it's all those gremlins trying to, we're at war with the gremlins, just trying to get more and more to create, you know, uh, homeostasis. Yeah. So with these with these gremlins, and I and I I, I love the the terminology there. And you have great you know you have great uh, images in the book, kind of showing you know showing these different examples here. Is it is it on act of of viewing consumption that is starting to now teeter to to that side, or is it at the end completion? Because I you know orgasm, masturbation. So when is the I guess it beginning to you know t- uh, teeter towards the pleasure side when we're watching it or when we're done. Aha, uh-huh, great question. So one of the things that my the patient, uh, Jacob, that I describe in, in the book that mm-hmm. he talks about is it wasn't, it's, it's not just the pleasure of the orgasm. It's all of that anticipation, all of that working up toward it. And that's the, the motivation fantasy, part that you were talking about at the beginning. Yeah, right. And the fantasy itself. So it, we can, we have this incredibly vivid ability to recall what gives us pleasure and even our memories of that experience can release dopamine, followed by a dopamine deficit state, right? Which creates yeah. the, the, the craving and the desire to use. And so in his cases, it wasn't, it was just, it was it wasn't just the the event itself, it was the build-up to it. It was, you know, the fact that he had to get the parts to make the masturbation machine and thinking about how to make it and how to program it. And all of that was part of the pleasure. It became part of this complex biopsychosocial disease that is addiction. And we know in the brain, for example, if you train a rat to know that when it sees a light, it can go to a lever, press the lever and get cocaine, that as soon as it sees the light, it will get an increase in dopamine firing in the reward pathway, followed, interestingly, by a dopamine deficit state, which then drives the rat to then even more want to go to and press the lever to get the big bolus of, you know, of, of juice or dopamine, which is from the cocaine. How, how quickly uh, does it, does it become addiction? Maybe, maybe we should define your, your definition of, of, of addiction, but then you've also, you know, you, you said before, you know, there, there could maybe be healthy, you know, there a healthy use of this. So, you know, a, can we define addiction and then how quickly can we get addicted? And are certain people, certain brain types, certain individuals more susceptible to getting these dopamine addictions? Yeah. So addiction is the continued compulsive use of a substance or behavior despite harm to self and or others. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual usually uses the four C's out of control use, compulsive use, craving, and consequences plus two physiologic signs and symptoms, one of which is tolerance. Tolerance means your drug stops working over time. You need more potent forms or more of it to get the same effect. And withdrawal means that when you try to cut back or stop, you experience physical withdrawal. And one of the most interesting things to me about, uh, you know, sex and pornography addiction is that the withdrawal is incredibly physical. So not only is there this, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the the universal symptoms of withdrawal, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, but there's also quite a physical, like a fatigue, a kind of general lassitude, even uh, patients describing physical pain when they withdraw from pornography, which I think is really interesting. And of course, there are the sexual dysfunctions that arise with, you know, repeated masturbation, including, you know, erectile dysfunction, inability to get an orgasm, um, this re- sustained refractory period all of which, you know, requires a period of abstinence in order to recover a physiologic sexual function. Got it. What were the, what were the four C's? Again, I got control, compulsion, C- craving. 
And consequences. Consequences. Especially con- yeah, especially continued use despite consequences. That's sort of the, the sine qua non or the crux of, of, of a severe addiction. Got it. So so would that be kind of the area that somebody would, would spend some time in, you know, auditing themselves to see if they have an addiction? Like, is that is that where you would recommend they go? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it takes, you know, so what I recommend is this this dopamine acronym. Okay. Uh, where D, D stands for data. That's where we're really root ruthlessly honest with ourselves and 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 prefer, preferably another human being about mm. what we're actually doing where we say sorry this is how many hours this is what i looked at or this is if it's not pornography and it's actually chasing down partners this is what i did to find partners this is how i interacted with them all of that so actually like what what's the data what are you doing because the other thing that happens you know with addiction is that we not, don't just lie to other people we lie to ourselves mm-hmm. And then it's really outside of our conscious awareness. So when we tell another human being or write it down and look at it, it's like, oh, wow, that's it becomes real in a way it really can't when it's pinging around in our heads. You're nodding. So I'm guessing that you know that from personal experience. The O of the dopamine acronym stands for objectives. That's where we write down what what is the thing that we're seeking? What What is our objective in doing this behavior? And when I work with families where um, typically the the husband or the father has struggled with sex addiction, it's of course so devastating for the partners. But one of the, the misconceptions I always try to dispel is that it's not sex addiction at the end of the day isn't even really about love or sex. It's about self-soothing, all the ways in which we're trying to self-soothe to deal with anxiety, depression, insomnia, uh, just trying to not be and not think and not, you know, just escape. It's it's just an escape, really. Um, but people will talk about, you know, what, why they use and, and, and what they get out of it. And then the P of the dopamine acronym stands for problems. That's where we're brutally honest about, okay, well, how is it interfering with my life, right? What, what's happening? Am I having health consequences, work consequences, relationship consequences? Am I behaving in ways that are orthogonal to my values and inconsistent with my values, right? Am I lying? Am I, am I doing things that I'm ashamed of, right? Which happens in addiction as we kind of gradually lose our moral compass yeah. as our brain becomes hijacked by the overwhelming physiologic urge to get our drug to restore homeostasis. So those are the that's a good place to start. And then, of course, setting a quit date and doing this 30-day um, abstinence trial or dopamine fast from, from masturbation, from orgasm in any form, from pornography, from sex partners, just no sex. And even... I um, recommend no fantasy, so mm. no, uh, it's, which is very challenging and very difficult, but which I think is really um, kind of the cherry on top is that not even letting ourselves have that euphoric recall. No, Sorry, I was going to say that, and that's during a 30 day detox. And is that yeah. because when we visualize, like you were saying, uh, when you visualize, you, you're going to get some of that small drips of dopamine. Exactly. You got it. And patients will some, you know, what's very common in those first in that early recovery phase is erotic dreams. Actually, for anybody quitting any drug, you know, they'll they'll have dreams of using using dreams, um, and that that happens with uh, with sex addiction too. And people people will wake up like in a cold sweat, like, oh no, you know, I used and and then, but with sex addiction, because as, as somebody once said, the bar is in my brain, um, which I thought was a great way to put it. You know, does that you know, what does that count as a relapse? What does that do to my dopamine? And what I say is, well, you know, as long as you don't intentionally stay in the dream, you know, then it's okay. Then that's not a relapse. But the moment you were kind of intentionally trying to stay there, then, you know, then, then it's probably a bit of a slip. Um, at least as we're trying those 30 days to try to reset reward pathways. Got it. And what is, what is our goal with that 30 days? I mean, is it, is it 100% heal cured and we day 31, we're back to normal life. We don't have to worry about this anymore. We just continue to move on or what are we looking to accomplish in the first 30 days? And then what does day 31 beyond look like for somebody that's struggling with this? Yeah. So those 30 days, the, the number one goal is to reset dopamine reward thresholds to get those neuroadaptation gremlins to hop off the pain side of the balance, to get our bodies to start to upregulate dopamine production and dopamine receptors and to restore balance. And that is crucial. And that is why sometimes patients will ask me, well, 
if my long-term goal is just moderate use of pornography or, you know, some moderate use of, of orgasm, then can't I just cut back? And I said that generally, no, it doesn't work because you never restore dopamine thresholds, right? You're always kind of chasing it. Instead, what you need to do is stop it completely for a month, which is on average the amount of time it takes for the gremlins to hop off and for reward pathways to reset themselves. And and you do and you do that in order to reset those reward pathways. But the other reason for the 30-day dopamine fast is that when we're chasing dopamine, we really can't see true cause and effect. And that in order to really see the true impact of these behaviors on our lives, we have to stop them for long enough to reset reward pathways. And then we look back and what patients will often say is they don't even recognize that person. It's like some surreal alien that they don't even recognize as themselves. Who is that person that's so prioritized this compulsive behavior above all these other things that I value? And so that kind of awakening really only happens with this dopamine fast. And then the key piece is deciding, okay, what now? You know, what's next for me? Um, how, do I want to continue to abstain in this very extreme sort of way, this kind of extreme physical and mental celibacy? Or do I want to go back to using sex, orgasm in some kind of different or moderate way? Um, and most people, you know, of course, want to go back to integrating sex in their lives. We, you know, sex could be a really wonderful and healthy part of our lives. Um, but then we have to talk about, well, what does that look like? Got it. Yeah. Anna, this is, this is so powerful for me. I mean, one goal I had here today is obviously we're out here, we're doing, you know, we're doing a lot of work, aggressive marketing. We're putting content where, you know, we have coaching programs, courses, uh, one-on-one -on -one VIP We have groups, all these things. And I was like, okay, part of what I wanted to get out of today was just verification that what I'm doing is, is correct in one lens. Like, you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't have your education. I don't have your background. Yeah. I'm certified SPARC. And, you know, obviously I have a big, big background in health and fitness and life coaching and, and leadership development, NLP. So a lot of, a lot of our work is coming at it from, from a holistic approach. But, you know, we talk about data and, and, and many times it's that actual, just sharing it with one person, because you talk about this shame and realizing like the minute you talk about, talk about it with somebody else. A lot of times that's me. That's what we accomplished in our first call is like, I just want to provide a safe place where you can actually tell the truth. And many times just right. getting it and realizing like, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not a broken human being. You're not the only person that's struggling with this. Many times that is the, that's the biggest part for, for these guys, right? And that was, that was me is just getting, getting this shame removed. So can you, can, can you speak to the importance of just being honest and, and truthful with yourself and others? Oh, yeah. So so one of the things that I actually prescribe to patients is radical honesty. I say this month, when you're trying not to use, uh, you can't tell a lie about anything. And it's not just that you can't lie about use. You can't even lie about why you were late for the meeting in the morning. You know, you can't say the traffic was bad. You have to say, if someone asks you, hey, what's going on? You're late. You can't, you have to say, sorry, I, uh, I just took too much time. I misjudged. You know, I, I spent too much time drinking coffee and reading the paper. So you have to tell the truth about everything. Why is that so important? For a number of different reasons. But I'll start again with the pleasure pain balance. We have this incredibly keen memory for the initial stimulus, whether it's pleasure or pain. But we're almost amnestic for the gremlins, what happens as a result of that stimulus, right? We don't remember that. It's crazy. So for example, my patients will talk about this euphoric recall of using their drug as being one of the main triggers for them to relapse, but they cannot or have difficulty accessing the memory for all the terrible things that happened after they started, after they used. The same thing happens with painful stimuli, right? We have a really vivid memory for painful stimuli. Like every day when I get up and I tell myself I need to get out of bed and exercise, all I can think about is how I don't want to get out of bed and don't want to exercise because it hurts. Right. What I don't remember vividly is that those gremlins are agnostic to which side of the balance they hop on. And if I press on the pain side with exercise, they'll hop on the pleasure side and I'll get my after exercise dopamine, my high, which is really great way to get dopamine. But I don't remember it every day. I have to remind myself anew. How does this lead into telling the truth? The stories that we tell about our lives serve as a kind of extended memory for us to remember the gremlins that we are very liable to forget. So when we're telling other people what we're actually doing in detail, it becomes real to us. 
we rewrite our autobiographical narratives, right? And we can't no longer deny that the behavior is happening. And in doing that, in telling that story, those autobiographical narratives don't just organize past experience, they actually become a roadmap for the future, right? So that that person and I now together hold this narrative, we hold this roadmap. And if you're in a group, even a larger group, you hear other people talk, that reminds you about your own experience. It's like an extended hippocampus. We hold it together. And that those words as tools and stories becomes the way then we can remember what, what really happens when we use our drug, which our own brains are liable not to let allow us to remember, right? All we think about is, oh, that would feel so good if I really want to do that now. That would feel that would feel really good if I could do that right now, you know? And we don't remember all the horrible how it we don't remember how it really stopped feeling good a long time ago. It stopped working. It doesn't even work, right? It doesn't even work. And then afterwards I feel horrible, right? I can't remember it. All I can think of is that oh, that would feel really good right now. So telling the truth becomes absolutely fundamental. Telling the truth to another human being who you trust is really important. Telling it in a group and hearing other people's stories becomes really important because, again, it's a way that we can keep those gremlins in mind. And then in the book, I talk at length about the way that truth-telling also fosters true intimacy. We think when people see you know, all the icky things we've done that they'll go running, but actually they give us a big hug because... We're all, you know, struggling in this life and they're, you know, we're, you're not alone in our struggles. Also, I suspect that telling the truth, and by the way, the average adult tells one to two lies per day. So everybody lies. <laughs> um, and telling the truth is actually, with, if you try to go through a whole day and not lie about anything, you'll find how hard it really is to do. Because we all kind of fudge it a little bit to make ourselves look better. But if we actually tell the truth about everything and we don't let ourselves try to look better, what it does is it upregulates the prefrontal cortex, or at least that's my hypothesis. And the prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain that allows us to delay gratification, to plan for future consequences. It's also the storytelling part of our brain. It's really connected to that pleasure pain balance and those limbic or emotion structures and is key for putting on the brakes uh, on compulsive overconsumption. Wow. This is this is this is incredible. And are you familiar with the term like reboot? I know it's it it, it I'm not sure if it's cl a clinical term, but it's obviously in kind of the, the recovery space. Like they talk about this reboot and that's kind of getting on the other side of the 30, 60, 90 days. So believe kind of what I'm hearing you say is like the, the radical honesty, like just the openness and, and the ability to, you know, just tell the truth is speeding up that that rebooting, rewiring process. Is, oh, is yeah. that is that Absolutely. accurate? Yeah. And, and also creating a kind of um, neurological self-finding, you know, which I talk about. We need these self-finding strategies so that we're not relying entirely on our, our willpower. But yeah, it's it's basically, it's the, so the process of recovery, according to my colleague, Edie Sullivan, who's looked at this, when we, once we get addicted, we've probably permanently damaged parts of our brain, but recovery consists of rerouting around those damaged parts and building new neural networks. Got it. So what are some, what are some other things that, that men can do? You know, I get guys all the time. They're like, how do I speed up this, 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 you know, this rebooting process? I'm like, first of all, pause that and just check your words. Because many times for me, I see the need to get it now, like the instance yeah. thing, like that's a big problem of, that's how I've kind of diagnosed it is like, right. you have, like you're seeking this instant gratification. So coming to me, asking me, how can I speed this up? You're actually, that's the problem <laughs> is you're trying to get everything right now. But obviously I know what they're asking me or like, what are some yeah. of these things that I can do to kind of get the gremlin over from the pleasure onto the the other side. So what are some other things? I mean, obviously seeking pain, but like the workout, like what are, what are some other like actionable yeah, so, things that, that guys can so, do? Yeah. So hormesis is, is a term that is, is a Greek term that means to set in motion. And hormesis is a whole branch of science showing that if we expose ourselves to mild to moderate noxious stimuli, what happens is that it's actually, it, it actually, tells our bodies to start upregulating and creating more dopamine and other feel-good neurotransmitters like serotonin, norepinephrine, uh, our endo-opioids, our endocannabinoids. So intentionally leaning on the pain side of the balance, like with exercise, like with ice cold water baths, intermittent fasting, any of that will get those gremlins to hop on the pain side of the balance, which will potentially speed up restoring this dopamine equilibrium, which is what we, we need as the first step to getting better. Although I will say, I, I totally agree with you. You know, there's not going to be a quick fix. This, you know, you can't like, 
do the massive hard workout burn yeah. and slam down on the pain side and like that's going to do it. In fact, if you do that, you're liable to get addicted to pain, right? What we're talking about is an iterative daily process, slow process every day. These practices are daily practices over a long period of time at daily mild to moderate noxious stimuli, exercise as tolerated, whatever your fitness level is, ice cold water as tolerated, not to some crazy degree. We're not talking about cutting on yourself, which will work in the short term, right? To, to make you feel good. It'll make you high and release endogenous opioids. It won't restore your, your pathways because it'll just confuse your gremlins and they'll be like, wait, what, what's going on here? The, you know, so it's, it's a slow and iterative process to, to get, you know, back to that balance, telling the truth, doing things that are hard to a moderate degree will help. But one of the things that I say too is, you know, there's really no easy way out of this. Like you are going to be in pain, not even pressing on the pain side, just giving up your drug. Those gremlins are going to smash you down to the side of pain. And this is going to be really, really hard. So I do not minimize how incredibly challenging it is. And I, I just, I do a lot of empathizing, but I don't minimize. I said that this is a hard road. This is a really, really hard thing. I believe you can do it, but boy, you're going to have to learn to sit with distress and feel, feel how it just washes over you like a wave and then goes away. It does go away. A hundred percent. And, and, and that's a lot of the approach that, that, that we take. It's, you know, it's rooted in responsibility. It's rooted in becoming, you know, the best version or the man that you were created to be. And many times it's like, if you're going to build your body, like I have a background in bodybuilding, like you don't walk on stage without like seeking out some pain. So I've, I mean, I've probably somewhat of a masochist myself, you know, uh, yeah. to, to want to, you know, to want to, you know, pursue that. But I tell these guys, it's like, when you realize like, okay, you're going to sit in this for a little while, but then you get on the other side of it. Yeah. Think of all now you can accomplish. It's like, I got to get through this little bit of discomfort and pain. And then this whole world unlocks inside of me. You know, I'm a big fan of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned, you know, the ice bath and, and fasting. Like I'm a big proponent of both hot and cold therapy. So I have a sauna here in my house. I've done it every single day for almost 18 months now, immediately followed by a cold shower. We do a lot of fasting as well. We actually extend in our program out to 24. And then at one point we extend it into a 48 hour fast. And, and there's some spiritual stuff that we kind of get into there as well. Yeah. But, um, you know, I love that you're, you're kind of, once again, like you're, you're just reinforcing like everything that we've built into our, our coaching and our curriculum is like, this is, this is the path, but no, there is no quick flip right. of a switch. Like you're going to have to trust the process. You're going to have to sit in the discomfort and the pain. Right. And it's got to come from the place of like, you're the one that's, that's gotten you here. Nobody, nobody got you the addiction other than yourself. And yeah, there's trauma and all these other things. And, and obviously, yeah. you know, uh, I, you know, there's, there's certain individuals that perhaps I can't work with. That's something I definitely wanted to ask you. So, you know, you're, you're a clinician, like I'm, I'm a coach. So I, I know that there's probably some men that, you know, I just wouldn't be able to help. Would you be able to maybe like define like what would be the difference in, in, in the person that I could help and the person that needs true clinical help? Like, how would you diagnose that? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I don't okay. know <laughs> because, you know, it's a, it depends so much on like whether or not they feel a connection. Right. Yeah, and there's a lot of people I can imagine would feel a much stronger connection to you than they'd ever feel to me. So those people, you hmm. could help more than I could. So I, I just, I, you know, I just, it's not, I, I don't think there's like a one size fits all. Got it. Got it. Um, we've, we've, we've talked about your book and you mentioned here a couple of times. One of the things I know that, that really, I believe drew me in, and I'm sure it's drawn so many people in, you talked about it briefly here, here as well as your own personal struggle. You know, what was, what was, what was the motivation or, or inspiration behind, you know, sharing that much, you know, personal struggle? Like, was there any fear about, you know, your role and your position? Like, how am I going to be viewed as a professional? How'd you overcome that? And, and what did sharing that do, do for you? Yeah, great, great question. Well, I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, uh, I've had certain things happen in my life um, that, you know, have convinced me, separate from my addiction to romance novels, that that really we're all broken and, and highly flawed, and that when we recognize that and reach out to others, um, our lives get so much better. And my, my belief around this has only been reinforced by my work with patients with uh, addiction, um, you know, who, who just reach this, this place where they just feel so, you know, so, so flawed, you know, and, and maybe irreparably broken. 
And yet that is really in many instances that moment where um, they're, they're able to finally ask for help and disclose that to another human being and, and then see what comes of that, which is invariably positive and powerfully good, good things. So although it was very scary for me to think about, you know, am I compromising my position as, you know, a psychiatrist at Stanford by talking about getting addicted to romance novels? Sure. I mean, I was terrified. But on the other hand, all of the stories in my book are true stories that my patients were willing to share anonymously to help others. And so I really thought, I can't ask my patients to share these stories and not be willing to share my own. So I just, I, I felt I had to include it. I also really wanted to... I've read a lot of books by doctors where they just sort of seem like they walk on water. And I thought, geez, you know, I'm really messed up. It would be nice, you know, to read a book about a doctor who's as messed up as I am. So that was sort of my gift, you know, to readers was like, yes, there are messed up doctors out there. I mean, they probably knew that already. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But, you know, to be specific about the ways in which I, too, struggle um, and I also really wanted to make addiction something that's not something that happens to, it's like this weird, strange thing. I wanted to really say, hey, you know, this can happen to anybody. And it is happening to all of us, you know, in a world in which almost everything's become drugified. No, I love that. I love that so much. And that's a big reason why, you know, I started this podcast and why I really, you know, went all in on 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 the coaching and the work. It's like, you know, I'd been a bodybuilder. I'd been a successful business owner and, and entrepreneur. And it's like, yeah, I had from what the outside people will look like is like a successful life. But then like inside, it's like, no, I was dead. And this thing was eating, eating me away. So, you know, if, if I could get caught up in this and I know a lot of guys don't have my resource, they don't have my background, they don't have my network. Yeah. They don't, they don't know the people that I know. And like, they, I, I really feel like there was a need for me to just openly talk about my own struggles. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I've experienced this kind of radical honesty, like it's just yeah. changed my, my, my life. And I didn't know if there was something maybe with, 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 with you as well. Um, I do want to ask you about another story. And I think it may be the individual that we've kind of, you know, mentioned a, a, a few times that had the major addiction. There had reached a point, I believe, in, in working with him, or maybe it's a different person. I can't recall the actual name, but I think you had tried so many things and he had you know, had found some success and he relapsed. He found some success and relapsed and it reached this ultimate breaking point where like, I reached a point where I had to take kind of my scientist hat off and I told him to pray. And, yeah. and, and first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that you put that part in there, but can you speak to what you were looking for him to get that science or your, like the therapeutic work can't provide? And then what role does that, that he was looking for play in a true successful recovery? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, so that was Jacob, um, the, the 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 patient with the severe, uh, um, you know, sex addiction, um, and he had he had been raised in a Catholic, uh, you know, context, and he had, and so for him to to recommend or prescribe prayer, you know, felt appropriate, you know, in his case. But I will also say that I am, I mean, I. Have, I've seen this in my patients and I've really come to believe very powerfully that the process of recovery is very much aided by this spiritual awakening. And how do I understand that? Basically this recognition that we will all bump up against something in our lives that our big brains and our incredible willpower will still not be able to solve. And that can take many different forms and with people with severe addiction, it takes the form of the unmanageability, um, you know, and their inability to control the behavior, even despite repeated attempts to do so. And in that moment, giving control over to a power greater than ourselves, however we define that can be absolutely the pivotal therapeutic moment. And of course, this is the corner- cornerstone of the 12 steps, right? Um, and you don't have to believe in any kind of particular religion or even a personal God to make this pivot, that this pivot, um, this pivot rests on the recognition that my brain and my will and my actions alone will not overcome this problem. I am not enough. I am insufficient. I cannot do it alone. And I will reach out to something outside of myself and ask for help. And in asking, I will, I will receive help. And it's an incredibly powerful thing. I just saw a young man last week 
who was struggling with a terrible video game addiction and a kind of a great lassitude that's come over him as a result of all the time he spends consuming online media and other online content. And he knows what he needs to do and he cannot bring himself to do it. And so I said to him, you know what I'm going to prescribe for you this month? I'm going to prescribe that you pay, pray for 10 minutes every day mm. and that you ask a power outside of yourself to help you find the will and the energy to make one small incremental change that you've been unable to do by yourself. And he was willing to do that. So uh, I will see in a month. But this is really, really important. And it's mysterious and amazing. We don't know how it works. But I suspect that what's happening, at least in the brain, is that we shut down the, let's say, the more problem-solving cognitive kinds of functions um, of our brains, and we activate the inherently spiritual part of our brains, because we probably do have a part of our brain that has evolved over millions of years to pray and to worship the divine, that what's sometimes referred to as the God spot, and we essentially activate that part, and in activating that part, we change the whole. Um, and then we're able to do things that we're not able to do without activating the God spot. Yeah, now how how similar, how, how closely tied to this would, would you say perhaps maybe a gratitude practice is? That's something you see kind of big in, you know, high performance personal developed world. It's like, you know, great, you know, write, find three things to write down to be grateful for every single day. And I know a big part of, of a prayer is, I mean, there's an element of, of gratitude, right? Like if you're going to, you know, if you're going to pray to your higher power, you're going to pray to your God, like you're, you're going to start off by thanking him just for the fact that you're here today. So is there, is there any closely tie here with, you know, a, a part of our brain that is, that is lighting up when we, uh, w when we express gratitude? And is that kind of in the same area with what you're speaking to here? Yeah, I think it might be. Um, so, so, I mean, what, what can happen, you know, in life in general, as well as in our addictions, is that we get really caught up in all the ways in which, like, our lives are crap. And also that it's potentially all these other things that are happening to us that are causing us to not be able to get out of this behavior. And so when we're exercising gratitude, we're basically paradoxing ourselves and saying, okay, I don't feel gratitude, right? Because I, I, I feel lousy. I don't feel gratitude, uh, but I'm going to force myself to engage in the act of feeling gratitude to kind of fake it till you make it as a way to kind of, yeah, activate a part of our brain that is not necessarily... I mean, it could be relating. I mean, people are thanking God, but there are ways to be grateful without giving up power to something outside yourself. I guess for me, the key sort of pivot is really this recognition that I am not in control. That to me is really, really important. It's this control piece. Like I don't have control. I can't control it. I'm not in control. I'm going to I'm going to acknowledge that if I'm not in control, something or someone else is, and I'm going to say, okay, whatever's in control, I could use a little help down here. Yeah. And I, I, I guess the only place that I could see potentially maybe that getting dangerous is if you don't give it up to something bigger and beyond you. If you're saying I'm not in control, it's just everything outside of me, then there's a possibility of your, your kind of victim mentality, but it's directing that I'm not in control you are like, right. like kind of right. right. You got to kind of, you know, walk, walk that right. Fine, yeah. No, fine no, line you're there. right. It, yeah. The I'm not in control is, is not about like, it's everybody else's fault. So that's a problem, right? Yeah. It's more about the ways in which we repeatedly mm -hmm. think we're in control yes. or try to, you know, get control. Yes. Um, it's the antidote to that piece. Yeah. It's the, the original sin in the, in, in the garden, right? You'll, you'll become gods. Um, Anna, this has been incredible. Um, obviously, I want to be be respectful of your time and bring this bring this here her home. So, um, obviously, I want to get people to you know direct them to to your book and then anywhere else that you know you're you're hanging online. I know you're not a big social media person, so if people want to pick up the book, where can they find that? And where can they maybe find more out about you and the work that you're doing? And then we'll wrap up with our last question that we end every single episode here today. Okay, great. Um, I've loved the conversation. The book is available wherever books are sold. It has audio version and e-version and more about my work at the website dopaminenation.com or analemke.com, which is the same website. Got it. And those redirect to the same thing. Yeah, guys. So we'll yeah. get that shared down. I highly recommend getting the book and the audio. Anna reads it herself. It's always great when you get the author's um, just passion through, through the book. So guys, we'll share all that down there in the show notes. 
So Anna, we have one question we in every episode with. Obviously, the title of this show is The Superman Life. And we've kind of mentioned it here, you know, a few times throughout. It is a product of my own story in my own journey. And when I talk about living a Superman life, for me, it's it's more of a belief system. It's really try how I try to show up and live in the world every single day. And it's coming mm-hmm. from the place that I do believe that we were put here for a purpose. There's a calling on each one of our lives. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a calling for Anna to be studying the brain and be sharing this information with the world. There's a calling for Frank to be coaching and helping individuals. But that's only half of the equation, right? Like we have to actually do our part. We have to be aggressive and intentional in the work that we're doing. And when you combine those two things together, that's what I believe is ultimately living a superhuman life. But Anna Lemke, as we bring it here to a close today, how would you define living a superhuman life? Yeah, I really like uh, your definition. I think it it converges on mine too. It's about being awake for the life that you've been given. Addiction is really about turning away from that life that you've been given and and and, and living your life in in a kind of a dream state. Um, so instead, wake up from that dream turn toward the life you've been given and see, you know, what the universe is asking of you. Mm, So beautiful. So beautifully said there. Guys, wake up, become the version (laughs) of yourself, chase your life. You have a purpose, you have a calling, but obviously check out Anna's work. If you've been struggling with this, if if you want to learn about these dopamine detoxes, if you want to hear some of these stories and just get a deeper understanding of this plain pleasure balance and how to get the gremlins off the one side and have them jumping over there on, on the other side. So we'll get all that shared down there below, guys. But obviously, we appreciate you for tuning in. If you want to help us continue to grow this mission and this message, you can support us in one of two ways. First off, if you're listening there on Apple or whatever podcast platform, make sure to leave a five-star rating and written review. But most importantly, if there's somebody that needs to hear this message something triggered you today and you're like so and so needs to hear what anna had to share do us a favor but do them the blessing by sharing this conversation with them but for dr anna lemke frank richie at the superman life we love you guys and we'll see you next week